William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. I knew a man once who sought epitaphs with the noblest form of literature. I liked them, too. It's the one place where they say only nice things about you. The only trouble is you don't hear them until you're dead. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. <laughs> Barry Craig speaking. I spent most of the afternoon composing a snide letter in my mind to the management of the office building where I read an office. Although I had no fundamental objections to a little dust here and there, I felt nevertheless that it ought to be disturbed from time to time. The old lady picked by the management to do the cleaning apparently had other ideas. They consisted mostly of rearranging the furniture in the office. This was a small laugh because the furniture consisted of one desk and two chairs. By the time I got the letter all finished, I was too tired to write it. I decided to let it go to the next morning. That way, I'd be employed for another day. Hey, this was no hour to acquire a client. What did they think, anyway? That Barry Craig didn't keep office hours like anyone else? If that's what they thought, they were right. Come in. Oh, good afternoon. Craig? That's right. My name is Jason Potter. How do you do? I'm uh, disturbed about my wife. Well, that happens. Has she been making eyes at people or what? Not at all. I almost wish she had. How large and almost is that? It was merely a manner of speaking. My apologies. What disturbs me is her sudden interest in literature. You don't approve of literature? It's not that. You see, Mr. Craig, my wife has been going about pricing epitaphs. You're telling me this why? You want me to interest your wife in a short story, maybe? Or a rhymed couplet uh, instead of epitaph? I want you to make sure that she has no immediate use for any epitaph she may be smitten by. She's epitaph happy? Or just unhappy about you? That is hardly your concern. So far, none of this is my concern. Perhaps I can change your mind. So? Well, nice white envelope. Look inside, will you? Okay. Well, five hundred dollars. You really don't care for epitaph, do you? Not my own. Not for some time yet. How long do I have to keep you alive in order to earn this? Until I get my divorce. I don't handle divorce cases. It won't be necessary for you to. I have all the required evidence. I merely want you to see to it that I'm divorced by a judge, not by a bullet. Mr. Potter stared at me for a moment out of very cold blue eyes, turned and left. His tailoring impressed me from the rear as strongly as it had from the front. He shut the door quietly behind him, proving he was a gentleman. I counted the bills that had been in the white envelope all over again. This proved I wasn't a gentleman. It still came out to $500, so I went to work. I picked up the potters at their townhouse. Of course, I didn't know if they had a country house, but they certainly had a townhouse. All they needed was Grant to make it a dead ringer for Grant's tomb. They went downtown, and I followed them. They parked, and I parked. They walked into the Parakeet nightclub, and I walked into the Parakeet nightclub. Good evening, monsieur. I take your hat, no? No, no, you couldn't put my hat in with those others you've got there. Why not, monsieur? They'd probably walk out and protest. <laughs> monsieur is a witch, no? Monsieur is no wit at all. Not only that, but he remembers you from Brooklyn. Oh, monsieur, Miss the best. Barry Craig. Hi, Marge. Not Marge, Mr. Craig. I'm Cece. The management decided they needed a French hat check girl. I guess they kind of figured it was sexy or something. I'm sure the hat's appreciated. So I'm Cece. You make a very nice Cece. That couple that just walked in, the Potters, do you know anything about them? Oh, no, not a thing, Mr. Craig. Of course, Mrs. Potter's name used to be Gloria Blair. Her father used to be a millionaire, only recently he wasn't a millionaire anymore. She's 27 years old. Her hair used to be three shades lighter. 
And she's got a small mole under her left shoulder blade. She hates pajamas. Gosh, I wish I could help you out. But you don't know a thing about her. That's right, Mr. Craig. What was she doing before she married Potter? For fun or to eat? To eat. She didn't eat much. Oh. But for a while, she tried to make a bucket of thing in here. Potter struck me as being a very cautious cookie. How did she manage to land him? <laughs> to laugh. <laughs> Fifi, I'd like to laugh, too. Oh. Well, I think they incorporated her. They incorporated? Fifi, how would you like to be strangled? Gosh, I don't know. I guess the fellows I've been out with were too bashful to try. Who incorporated Gloria Potter? A Mr. Jones, mostly. You see, Mr. Potter was always scared some girl would marry him for his money. <laughs> you silly. What else does a girl get married for? Well, I'll check, and if I find out, I'll let you know. But seeing Mr. Potter was so prejudiced, this Mr. Jones gave Gloria a lot of money so she could pretend she was still rich. And she did, and Mr. Potter married her, and it was very romantic. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, where could I find this Mr. Jones if I wanted to? You want him to incorporate you, too? No, I'm not planning on getting married. Well, Mr. Jones, his first name is Oswald, but he doesn't like people to know that. And he's got a very beautiful apartment over at the Barham Towers. It's kind of a hunting lodge. It's on the 11th floor. A hunting lodge on the 11th floor? What does he hunt? <laughs> well, never mind. I'd better get back to work. Uh, so long, Fifi. Gosh, I wish there was something I could have told you about going It has been an interesting interlude along the sidelines, but it was time for me to get back into the main arena. The Parakeet was a very handsome and expensive nightclub filled with handsome and expensive people. I waved off a head waiter and stabbed myself a table a couple of feet from the one occupied by the potters. I had my first chance to take a good look at Mrs. Potter. I took a very good look. Mrs. Potter was worth it. At which point, somebody may have noticed my staring and decided to make it hard. They put the lights out. I made a dash for Potter's table and Potter. I got a hold of him. He objected, but I didn't treat him gently. <coughs> Maybe the shot hadn't been fired at Potter. It would have been a coincidence. I felt just as happy I hadn't tried to prove it. The lights went on after a while. How do you do, Mrs. Potter? Who are you? What have you done to my husband? My name is Barry Craig, and I think I've knocked him out. What on earth? I had to get him out of that chair. Dad! Mrs. Potter, who do you think those shots were fired at? About this time, we got lots of company. Head waiters, managers, newspaper columnists, and stuff. We should have got the police, too, but the kind of people who go to nightclubs like the parakeet can afford not to be public. The police were kept out. Potter began to revive after a while, and the incident could be considered closed. But before it was quite closed, Mr. Potter and I had a snack of dialogue. You must have been expecting an attempt on my husband's life. I had it in mind. Are you going to talk to the police? I've got no objection to talking to the police. As a matter of fact, some of my best friends are policemen. I wish you wouldn't. I don't suppose there'd be any use No, to... no, but people try, though. Mr. Craig, what are you doing later tonight? I might try sleeping. Before you do that, and, and before you talk to the police, please come to my house. Any particular reason? My husband doesn't understand you. <laughs> that isn't a very particular reason, is it? What he doesn't understand has nothing to do with romance, Mr. Craig. Oh, then it's a switch. What does it have to do with? Murder. At which point, Mr. Potter regained what was consciousness for him, and they left. I tried to leave right after them, but ran into a little trouble. The shooting had leaked somehow, and a few cops dropped in. They were too late for the Potters, but they were in time to hold me up. Not very long, but sometimes a half hour can be much too long. I was a little worried by the time I got to the potter's front door. I didn't want Gloria to think that I turned her invitation down. Not so much because I was afraid of hurting her feelings, but uh, because I had a notion that things were happening too fast. I was right. It was a solid door and it had been built well. Nothing happened except I got a bruised shoulder out of the effort. Who? Barry Craig, Mr. Potter. Excuse me. You came. I came, only I think I was a little late, wasn't I? Those shots. They came from my husband's study. Let's go ask your husband what he thought of them. All right. Anyone else in the house except your husband and you? Not so far as I know. The servants are away. That makes it convenient. Makes what convenient? Cut the list of suspects down. Suspects? Yeah, in case those shots were aimed any better than the ones back at the club. That's the door. 
Your husband's room? Yes. I used a handkerchief on the doorknob. If you don't mind, I wouldn't want to disturb any fingerprints either if they happen to be yours. Well, you... Well, it's open, but... But it was closed when you tried it? It was. At least that's the way you're telling it. Let's go in. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Potter. Hmm. If you're trying to be delicate about whether or not he's alive, you don't have to be. He can't hear you. Then he is dead. Dead as they come, and when they're murdered, they come very dead. <laughs> Gloria Potter went to a room in order to grieve, exult. I didn't bother speculating. I phoned the police and waited until they came. Barry? Yes, Lieutenant Rogers? Stop being so formal. I got the report of the business back at the Parakeet Club. I imagined you would. You were there too, Barry. Uh-huh. And then you show up here. It looks suspicious as anything. I don't kid me just because I went to college, Barry. It wasn't my fault. I was an underprivileged child. My parents had money. We won't hold it against you. Maybe even as the years go by, you'll be able to overcome your handicap. I'd try. Barry, why were you here? Mrs. Potter asked me to stop in. That's what you said the first time I asked you. It must be a coincidence. The captain won't like it. Why not? This month he doesn't believe in coincidences. I think it has something to do with the stars. Barry, you had a date here to do what? Mrs. Potter asked me to stop in. She said she wanted to explain something to me about how her husband didn't understand her. That's not going to sound so good in a murder trial. Doesn't sound so good even here. Have you talked to her? The doctor tells me she's suffering from shock. Translated, it means she doesn't want to answer any questions just now. I wonder why. Maybe she doesn't know the answer. Are you going to book her, Tran? I don't know. Nine times out of ten, I would. What makes this the tenth time? I'm not sure. Not enough facts for one thing. For another, nobody's mentioned a motive to me yet. You got a motive handy? I looked hastily through my pockets but couldn't find a motive. Lieutenant Rogers watched me with a highly unimpressed eye. I shrugged my shoulders and asked the lieutenant if I could leave. He wasn't happy about it, but I left anyway. Sure, I might have supplied him with some information about a motive, but it wasn't entirely my own secret. I thought maybe I ought to get Mr. Jones' permission, Mr. Oswald Jones. It wasn't hard to find the Barn Towers. The 11th floor had an elevator running to it, which I used. It may have been a hunting lodge, but it had an ordinary door out in front of it. I hoped Oswald wasn't out hunting. Yes? The name is Barry Craig. You're Mr. Jones? I am. Mind if I come in? That would depend on the nature of your business, Mr. Craig. I'm a confidential investigator. Indeed. That, however, is your occupation. Your errand? Gloria Potter. I dislike seeming finicky, but that again is merely a name, not a description of the reason that brings you here. I seem to be having a little logical difficulty with you, Mr. Jones, but uh, Mr. Potter is having difficulty of another sort. Mr. Potter? And his difficulty is what? His difficulty was staying alive. He doesn't have any more difficulty now. Meaning he is dead? He's dead. It is kind of you to bring me the information. You brought it, and... And I'm coming in. You, uh, you have, of course, the advantage of youth and perhaps of strength. I resent your intrusion, however. While you're resenting it, you must shut the door. Very well. You must be a very happy man, Mr. Jones. Indeed. Sure. An investment has paid off tonight. Perhaps I misunderstand you. I thought you were a confidential investigator, not a broker's agent. The investment I'm talking about doesn't have very much to do with the stock market, I don't think. It has to do with Gloria Potter. A lovely lady, but hardly... Hardly a dividend? She's returning dividends, though, or she will shortly be in a position to anyway. You had better make yourself clearer. I'll try. You stake Gloria Potter so she could marry a millionaire who was afraid that women were after him for his money. I may have lent Mrs. Potter some money in the days before she was married. At what interest? Look here, young man. I think we have done enough fencing. I've already told you I did lend Gloria Potter some money. I expect to have it returned. Whether with interest or not is no concern of yours. It might be a concern of the police. The police? Where do they come in? You do it very well. If it's an act, that is. Mr. Potter not only died, he was murdered. How distressing. You should practice expressions of distress. 
You didn't do that very convincingly. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. You lent Gloria money. You expected a return on it. That would have been fine. She did succeed in getting Potter to marry her, but Miss Jones, Potter was preparing to divorce her. Such, alas, are the vicissitudes of matrimony. One can never be certain, can one? You can spare me the philosophical remarks about matrimony. If Potter had lived long enough to divorce Gloria, you'd never have got your investment back or the profit on it. Then I suppose I must be mildly pleased that Mr. Potter did not succeed in divorcing Gloria. Sure, you must be pleased. What I'm curious about is, uh, how much of an effort did you make to guarantee your investment? Are you implying that I had anything to do with Mr. Potter's unhappy deceit? I'm asking you if you had anything to do with murdering him. That seems to me rather naive, Mr. Craig. Assuming that I may have had a hand in his untimely taking off, would I be likely to tell you about it? I don't know. There are no witnesses present. You could tell me in perfect safety. Perhaps. But why on earth should I? It might satisfy your ego. Mr. Craig, I am no longer a young man. I was never a handsome one. I perforce learned a great many years ago to abjure ego satisfaction, at least of the more obvious sort. I think the hour is late. I think your visit here is impertinent. Good night. Okay. Good night. Mr. Craig, that is not the direction of the front door. I know it is. Hey, let go, bring you off. Oh, but join us, won't you? I, I'm sorry, Mr. John. Uh, it doesn't matter, Baker. How do you do, Baker? Were you having fun listening in? Mr. John. Mr. Craig, this is my home. If I choose to have Baker stand by in case I should need protection against intruders like you... I just wanted to find out exactly what Mr. Baker's job was. You found out. And now... And now I leave. Uh, Mr. Jones. Yes? Has Baker got a license for that gun he's carrying? I'd left my car parked three quarters of the way down the block from the bomb tower. I didn't hurry getting to it. Maybe I thought somebody might take advantage of my being out in the open like this. The street was clear of pedestrians and of traffic. If anybody was going to take a crack at removing Barry Craig from the case, this was the time I preferred. I was waiting for it. But nobody took advantage. I got into the car. Then I stuck the ignition key in the lock, turned it, and, uh, and got out of the car as fast as I could move it. Nothing on my car is supposed to tick when you turn the ignition key on. It was pretty obvious the engine would need an overhaul. I didn't stay around to admire the wreckage. I thought that anyone who had gone to all that trouble of depositing an explosive in my car and hooking it up with ignition deserved to think that I'd been blown up with it for a while at least. Besides, I had a phone call to make. Hello, Trav. Found any motors yet? No, but I found something else. What? A wrecked car. Whose wrecked car? Mine. We don't issue traffic tickets in homicide. This particular car is in your jurisdiction, though. Or would have been if I hadn't got out of it fast enough. Somebody arranged to have it wrecked? Somebody arranged to have it blow up with me in it. Where are you? And that's not important at the moment. Trav, you've got a handful of uniformed men hanging around the late Mr. Potter's residence? Sure. Take them away. Are you losing your mind? No, I'm trying to find the killer. Trav and I had a small argument for a few minutes, and finally he gave up. I hung up. Then I tossed a metal coin to see who I would visit next. It turned out to be Mrs. Potter. Of course, I cheated. I wondered how surprised Gloria Potter would be to see me. Oh, Mr. Craig. He wasn't much surprised. May I come in? I suppose so. I don't have much of a right to decide what to do or what not to do right now. That sounds very bitter. It is. The cops have been getting in your hair? That's their job, I suppose. Well, they're not working at it anymore. What do you mean? No more cops around the house. You're joking. No. Nope. You've got a window. Take a look. I shall. You're right. Is that why you came? Because you knew the police had gone? Could be. Then you're another... Then I'm another what? Nothing. Well, if it is something, you'll tell me yourself in due time. 
I can make a guess. If the guess happens to be right, then I understand a lot of things I didn't before. I'm not really interested. You should be, for two reasons. One, the murder of your husband. Two, the attempted murder of me. Someone who tried to murder you? Uh Uh-huh. Why? Maybe because I was crowding someone. Someone who had already disposed of your husband. Need to bring that up? Sure. Your husband hired me. He was afraid he wasn't going to live long enough to divorce you. He didn't. Now, uh, you might try telling me the truth. About what? For example, what do you hear from Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones? Mr. Oswald Jones. The gentleman who bought you the platinum tooth trap for Jason Potter. You have to get into it, too, don't you? Not the uh, two. It means someone else got in on the deal. You also said that I must be another. Another what? You didn't answer that. You mind if I make a guess? I don't mind anything you do. Thanks. When I walked in here and told you the cops were gone, you thought I took advantage of their absence to come. You thought I was a blackmailer? <gasps> Thanks for telling me. It rounds out the picture. There must be someone else here in the house. No. Sure, there must be. After my car blew up, I had a phone call to make. That took time. I took a cab over. It took time before I found one. But whoever had arranged to have that car blow up wouldn't have hung around. He'd have come here. I don't know what you're... Someone else must have known that your husband was preparing to divorce you. I... I don't think that's been a very great secret. That would have given him a nice handle for blackmail. And then... Mr. Jones! Yeah, Mr. Jones, complete with revolver. I'm afraid I've been eavesdropping. For how long? A matter of minutes only. I missed the beginning of the conversation, but uh, on the other hand, I don't think I missed anything important. Okay, you didn't miss anything important. What now? You've become rather a nuisance, Craig, both to Mrs. Potter and to myself. All right, I've become a nuisance. So what? What does one generally do with nuisances? One removes them. That's a bright idea. Was it also your bright idea to kill Potter? I hardly think you are in a position to ask questions. You're not in a position not to answer them. You see, Mr. Jones, an attempt was made on my life less than an hour ago and less than a hundred yards from your house. Oh, nonsense. No, a wrecked car. You must have noticed it, leaving your house there. There would have been a crowd about it. Oh, now that you mention it, yes, but... Uh... Naturally, you knew nothing about it. Well, naturally. Which is what you'd say whether you set that bomb or not. However, the point is that the police know about that attempt. Interesting. More than that, anything happens to me and you're the first man they look for. Uh, I should be found quite easily. But that hardly constitutes proof. No, but uh, how much proof would they need against a man with your record? I'm inclined to see your point. What do you want? Your silence for a few minutes. I was carrying on an interesting conversation with Mr. Potter. He was about to tell me that someone was blackmailing us. He was also about to tell me why. I... Oh, what do you You know why I was being blackmailed. Jason was going to divorce me. The police didn't seem to know about it. As long as they didn't know, I was safe. The instant they found out, they'd suspect me. So, I was in a position to be blackmailed. Uh, I'm afraid I must have missed something. Exactly who is this blackmailer? Oh, there's no hurry about that as yet. Jones, in the event that Potter had divorced his wife, where would you have been? In the most despondent frame of mind and in financially straitened circumstances. You uh, you must know that, however. Sure, I know it. But it's nice to find out from the horse's mouth. Pardon the expression. Not at all. The next time I see a horse, I'll apologize to him, too. Okay, it's all set up. We know the background, the reason. All we need is the name. Which one shall it be, Mr. Jones? Your name? I did not murder Mr. Potter. How about you, Mrs. Potter? I couldn't have killed him. Sure you could have. The attempt at the nightclub. You were sitting right next to him at the table. And the murder happened in your husband's study. You'd know your way around here, wouldn't you? It was open. I did... Shut up. What's that? The Marines, I think. Whatever are you talking about? Don't the Marines always land and have the situation well in hand? I suppose in your adolescent way you're referring to the police. I had Lieutenant Rogers pull the uniformed men away from the house. I figured they would encourage some people to drop in on Mrs. Potter. He agreed, but I imagine he's insisted on bringing some non-uniformed men around. I, uh, I shall leave. Not quite yet. Why not? Because I object. Because the police will object. And because I think someone else might object. Someone else? 
Mrs. Potter, that door opposite the one both Jones and I used to get in here, where does it lead? The, the next room. It's, it's a sort of downstairs bedroom. Anybody been using it recently? Uh, I... Or do you always leave doors half a jar? Uh, I was afraid. He, he said he'd kill me if I... I bet he did. Come on in, Baker. Drop your gun, Mr. Jones. Baker? I said drop it. Very well. That's good. But, good heavens, why, Baker? Why? Because Baker, being your man, would know about your deal with Mrs. Potter. He'd know about the impending divorce. It put him in a nice position. He killed Potter and prepared to live off the inheritance for the rest of his life. He knew he'd have you to deal with sooner or later. But he figured that when that time arose, he'd manage. No one would really miss you. I suppose you're right. It had to be Baker. No one else would have bothered about me. Mr. Potter knew I was on the case. And you were with me at the time the bomb was planted. Ah, as soon as you entered, uh, he could have left the apartment, gone down, connected the bomb, and then returned. Yes, I see that. He thought I was competition. He decided to remove competition. He might just as well have signed his name to a confession of guilt. That's just shit, white guy. Right now, all I gotta do is get out of here. First making sure of you, and then I... I guess you didn't believe me about the police, did you? But they're here, they're surrounding the house. I can take my chances on that. Right now, what have I got to lose? Nothing. This isn't where you're going to lose it. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Craig. I'm afraid I shot Mr. Baker. Not seriously. But... The trouble with villains is they listen to the radio too much. On the radio, the hero never has a gun. Or if he has, never bothers shooting it. I'm different. I have a gun, and when someone is pointing a gun at me and intending to use it... Oh, I'm so glad. I trust the matter is for the moment satisfactorily concluded. Depends on what you mean by satisfactorily. Uh, I meant simply that Mrs. Potter seems to be advancing upon you with an expression of the intensest gratitude, and I suspect she will shortly fling her arms about your neck and... Oh, Mr. Craig, you think... Then... Kiss you. Mm. <sighs> I'm not a squeamish man, Mr. Craig, but there are some things I draw the line at. Good night. <laughs> Jones left. The police didn't mind. They had no charges to prefer against him. Mr. Baker didn't mind. He was unconscious. I didn't mind. I... I was... But that's another story, and not one I have any intention whatsoever of telling. to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Dead Lost, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story of the big grab about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, four crooks and a discarded wife gang up on a fight camp in a plot to steal his purse, only to find the camp has a secret weapon handy. The Triple Cross. Good night, folks. See you next week. Featured in the role of Gloria was Fran Carlin. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Mm-hmm.